which is such a good example given the topic for today of intentional relationships. And I can't think of a more intentional relationship than to adopt me into your family. So, um, and the good thing is you're not going to have to pay all that money. I'm, I'm, already, I'm already grown. I'm already, I'm already paid for it. But, but if you want to write me into the will, I'm more than willing to be a part of that as well. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Sowards. If you don't know me, I've uh, been the youth minister here for about 15 years now. And I know that sounds kind of weird, youth and 15 years. Uh, those things don't go together very often. Uh, but it is and has been a blessing uh, to be in that position here at church. And in those years, I've seen lots of different teenagers come through our youth program. And I've seen the ones who have intentional parents. I see the ones who are poured into by not just their parents, but other adults in this church. And the ones that receive that kind of attention, more times than not, are the ones that have a long-lasting relationship with the Lord. They have a, they're more successful. <clears throat> and so this morning, I want to talk about the importance of it, the importance of having intentional relationships. My dad uh, passed away, I guess it was about 13 years ago, um, this past summer. And my dad used to always say, you hear me? You hear me? I can hear him now. He, he would say, Andrew, or Andy, Andy, did you get your lessons? He, he was older. He was born in 1919, so, he was an old, so he'd say, get my lessons. And of course, I would always come back and say, well, what do you mean get my lessons? You know, I got my lessons. They're, they're right here. He wanted me to do my homework. And then he'd always say, you hear me? You hear me? And, and throughout my, my time with him, any time that, that he wanted my attention, he would always say, you hear me? You hear me? Any, anybody ever experienced anything like that? You had a parent that said something like that? Are you listening? Do you hear me? Yes, James. Um, are we listening to what God says? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, we have this section of Scripture that in the Jewish community, they, they actually go and they repeat this two times a day, usually in the mornings and at night with their families. And they call it the Shema, which literally means hear. You need to hear what it is that we're, we're, we're about to say. And this is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The very beginning here when he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The point is, the Lord alone is God. Just a few chapters earlier in Deuteronomy 4, uh, 35, it says this, You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides Him, there is none other. And this was... This was a charge to the Israelites as they were about to go into the promised land. They didn't want them to forget they were about to go into a land of idols. They were about to go into a land that did not focus, did not have its attention on, on the Lord, on Yahweh. And so he wanted to warn them as they went in and wanted them to have this relationship. And so this morning what I would like to do is go through this and pull out some of the importance of the Shema. First of all, he says, Love the Lord with all your heart. With all your heart. So with all of our, all of our decisions, all of our thinking, all of our feeling, we are to love the Lord. And then he says to love with all of your soul. The life that you've been given... It's really, it's literally the breath that lays within you. The Hebrew word is pneuma. You may have heard that word before, but it's the, it's the breath of life. Because without it, without our soul, without that breath of life, 
we have no being. And God breathed that into us. And then he goes further to love the Lord your God with all your strength. That is your effort, your possessions, your gifts. You know, we're about to have Antioch has talent. You know, we all have different gifts and abilities. Some of them we would want to put on display and try to entertain. But some of them are gifts like being a great listener. Gifts like being able to to put crafts together for children's classes or whatever that might be. Um, If I were, we do a fusion day camp in the summer. And if I were the only one that did fusion day camp, it probably would not be nearly as exciting, nearly as colorful, Um, There are all kinds of different gifts and efforts that come together to make that what it is. And so we have our heart, our soul, our strength, our effort, our possessions, this breath that is within us, our thinking, our feelings, and all of this, we, we pour it into our relationship with God. He says this next, Talk about it when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. And so the concept is really at home, walk around the road, walk along the road. Any place, any place that you are, it is an opportunity to talk about the Lord your God. Any place that you are. When you lie down, when you get up, any time. There's, there's never a bad time to bring God into the discussion, into your home. And then in verse 8, he says, Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Foreheads. Hands, everything that you do. Foreheads, everything that you think. It all goes into your relationship with God. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Our door frames is God in our home. We want God to be part of our home. And in our gates, out there for everyone to see it, we want our community to know that we love the Lord our God. And all of these things together will impress upon our children, will impress upon those that we come into contact with that God is important to us. Aaron and I, a couple of years ago, we were blessed. We, we found this house uh, in the neighborhood that we live in now. And this house, it was a short sale. Um, anybody ever bought a short sale before? Okay, I see a hand or two back there. Short sales, they're, they're typically short sales because they're not in the best of condition. The house that we moved into was a very nice home, extremely nice. Um, but the, the people who had lived in it before... Um, They had gotten behind in their mortgage and gotten foreclosed on. And I think out of frustration, and and, and maybe I would be frustrated as well, they they destroyed the house. Um, It was was really bad. Um, Lots of animals, and there was urine in the carpets, and marker, uh, sharpies all over the walls, holes in the walls in places. Um, It was just a real mess. But, and and you guys who know me, um, I got a great deal. So, so, so I, was, I was happy about it. So uh, anyway, so, so we buy this house and we go in and we literally strip it back down to the studs in, in, in lots of areas of the house, especially in the living room area. We, just, we took it all the way back down to the stud walls because we ended up doing some reconfiguring and things like that. And we had a night, and I couldn't find the picture. I was looking for the picture. We had a night when the youth group came over to our house. We had no heat. We had um, no air, we had nothing. It was cold. I remember it was cold because I think it was in January or February when we were kind of rehabbing the house. We did, we burned the floor, which was, which was kind of interesting, but we had planks from the floor that we tore up because we put new flooring in. And we burned the floor to keep warm inside the house. And it did have a wood burning fireplace. But we had the kids go all over the house and write scriptures all over the stud walls of the house, throughout the house. And, and we took pictures, and, and so it's, it's cool to be able to think about, I mean, we literally put the Word of God into the construction and framework of our home. And I think that's what God's trying to tell us right here. It, it needs to be not just 
And, and, and these sign, we have signs like this in our house, you know, um, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, Joshua, you know, I mean, we have those signs. But it, it, it's also more than just that sign. It's the inner part of who we are. It's, it's our home. And, and so we envelop God into that. I'm going to brag on my wife here just for a second. I didn't tell her I was going to do this. Um, my wife is uh, a great example for my family and for me. There's very rarely a day, I can't think of one, when she does not spend um, probably 20 minutes to an hour in God's Word. And, and she, a lot of times what she'll do is she'll take scriptures and she writes them on index cards. They're, they're wallpapering our bathroom, okay? Now this one, this wall is inside where our toilet is. So, you know, lots of time to sit there to focus... On, on God's word. But this is the idea. Um, I, I love that, that Aaron does this. Because for one thing, it, it's a reminder to me that God's word is important. It's a reminder to my kids. My kids see it. It's, it's not only in our bathroom, it's also in our bedroom, kind of under the TV. There's some scriptures there as well. Um, it, it is a constant reminder that our Lord is in control. And so writing those things on the door frames of your homes and on your gates. Um, I, if some of you were part of a class that I taught a few Wednesday nights ago, um, and I talked about mentoring, which there's a lot of overlap here. But I want to take just a moment, and, and those who were in the class, this will, you're going to recognize these pictures, and just share a few uh, stories about people who shared their faith with me as we walked along the way, as we sat down. Uh, the man in the top left-hand corner here, his name is Alan Jones. Um, Alan was a... Let me back up just a little bit. I did not grow up in church, and so when I started going to church, I was 16, 17 years old, and these are, these are my church parents. So not necessarily my parents, but my church parents, people who took interest in me, uh, people who show me the Lord outside of a Sunday, Wednesday night service. And so Alan Jones, he, um, he asked me to ride with him in the luggage van to go on a retreat one time. Seems like a pretty menial thing to do. And all the way up there, I, I don't remember what all we talked about. I'm sure he asked me about my family and just life in general and school and things like that. I can't remember everything we talked about, but I, what I remember is that he took the time and took the interest in me. And that created, therefore, an interest in me wanting to know more about God and, and his family. Uh, in the middle there, that's uh, Bill and Anita McIntyre. Anita um, was one of my church moms. Um, her son, one of her, one of her children, one of her sons was a groomsman in my wedding. Uh, they were another one that took uh, interest in, in myself. Um, she, she actually ended up, she and another lady at church, ended up doing the rehearsal dinner for mine and Aaron's wedding. They paid for it, took care of it and everything, uh, as my family was not able to do that. Uh, Mark Van Dyke, uh, Mark was an, I don't think he was an elder at the time. He ended up, actually, Alan, Eddie in the middle, and Mark all ended up becoming elders later on, uh, but th at this point they were not. But Mark is a uh, tremendous man. He, he loves people. Um, he spent a lot of time reaching out to me and talking to me. He currently lives in uh, the Philippines, and he works for uh, IBM, but he's planted a preaching school in the Philippines and is continually being an example and doing work over there. Eddie Julian, the, the guy right here in the middle, again, this was one conversation. I had one conversation with Eddie Julian. It was at his house. We were sitting on his back porch on the patio. I don't remember exactly what it was, I mean, he, whenever he saw me, he'd come up and hug me and ask me how I was doing. Um, but, but I remember we sang all in all that night. You, you remember things like that. And just, again, it didn't take much. It was just someone taking interest. Over here on the right-hand side, that was my, that's my youth minister uh, when I was in high school. That's Ed Bass. Uh, Ed, was, um, Ed was the first one that put into me the idea about being a youth minister. Uh, he took interest in me. He invited me to come on a middle school retreat and chaperone a middle school retreat when I was a junior in high school. And I taught a little lesson and um, I had to clean up after the flower 
bomb game. You know, I had to walk around the field. And I remember walking in the field and I'm picking up pantyhose filled with flour. If you want me to explain it later, I will. Um, but I'm picking those things up and I remember sitting out in the middle of the field and I just thinking, wow, this is what I want to do. Not, not pick up flour and pantyhose. <laughs> I want to be a youth minister <laughs> and clean up after teenagers. Um, which is a big part of it, by the way. Uh, and then later on, he took me to a youth ministry conference, started in, in introducing me to other youth ministers. And this was when I was a junior and senior in high school. And so I started to develop this passion for it and decided to go to Harding after that. And then lastly, uh, the man here on the left, that is Aaron's dad, Bill. Uh, Bill, the first time I ever met Bill uh, was when I went to pick up his daughter for a homecoming dance, and he greeted me in a ski mask holding a pickaxe. Um, but I, I came, I, I picked her up late at night, they lived on five acres, there wasn't much light, and I'm walking around the front of the house and I see this figure coming out of the dark with a pickaxe, and I thought, oh man, this is bad. Anyway, um, Bill, Bill was the first person uh, to ask me to really study the Bible. I mean, Aaron and I were talking about Scripture a lot. Aaron was, uh, we, we were talking on the phone at night. Uh, she was sneaking her cordless phone. Some of you guys know this. Sneaking the cordless phone to her bedroom so that we could study the Bible over the phone. Um, which, I guess, if you're going to defy your parents. If it's to study the Bible, it's okay. I, I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> But Bill, Bill, Bill asked me, kind of outside of church, saying, hey, would you like to learn more about the Bible? And so I would go over there. I can't remember if it was Tuesday or Thursday nights. And we'd spend a couple of hours just... And he started in the Old Testament and was taking me through the kings and the northern and southern kingdoms. And I'm thinking, what is all this stuff? It was kind of crazy. But I think what I took away from it was that he cared about me. And, and he wanted to have that that relationship with me. And so he was one of the first ones. Now, every person I just mentioned, they were not people that reached out to me on a Sunday or Wednesday night or in a church setting. That, that was not when they reached out to me. It was outside of these walls in a lot of ways. Here at our church, we, uh, we have a group of men, a group of elders. Um, I will tell you that um, these men have seen me sob like a baby. These men have prayed over me, have loved on me, have encouraged me. Very rarely, I can't even think of a time, honestly, that, that, that they've gotten on to me or anything. They've, they've, they've shown me nothing but love. A great example of what it means to, to not only pass on knowledge about God. You know, in Churches of Christ, we're really good about that. I think that's kind of our tradition. It's like we want to know the Word of God. We want to have the knowledge. But it's a lot more than passing on knowledge. It's also taking that knowledge and showing people how to love and to serve God. And so as we look at this, your heart, your decisions, your thinking, your feelings, pray and study together. Pray and study together. Your soul, you've been given, you know, that life that you've been given, worship together. Your effort, your possessions, that strength that God has given you. You know, we communicate a lot with our strength, with, with the things that we have, the things that we value, the way we spend our time. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to harp on people because Aaron and I are late sometimes to church too. But that communicates something about the value of our gatherings. It communicates something to our kids about what's important. Whether we're here on Sundays or Wednesdays, or, or it, it, we're, communic we're always communicating something. And, and I'll, I'll say this, if you have a kid that is here at church, you need to be volunteering in the children's program in some way. Your kids need to see that that's important to you. They need to see that you value that. Stacy and Laura should not be coming to me and asking me, hey, can you help me find volunteers? The volunteers should be knocking down the door because their kids and your kids need to see adults who actively, with their strength, 
love the Lord. And so I want to challenge you to think about that. If you have not volunteered before, it's, it's really not that hard. It's not that difficult at all. And I'm seeing some of my teachers out there say, it's really not. And it goes such a long way. And so look for opportunities to do that. At home, walk along the road, anytime, any place. And I put on there twice, not only at church, not only at church. We have, um, I love that we have worship services that we come together and we worship and we pray together. And we have this time, but, but let's not leave God in, in the box here at church. Let's take God with us everywhere we go. And look for those opportunities to share Him everywhere we go. Our hands, everything we do equals time. Everything we think, you know, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, everything we, we talk about, our door frames, we, we need things that are visible. And then also on our gates, in our community, our neighbors. There's a guy by the name of Brendan Manning, and I shared this uh, quote the other night when I, I taught this class. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. We have got to live for the Lord outside these walls. Not in a boastful, in-your-face kind of way, but in a bring glory to God kind of way. I might even go and replace it with a few other things. That is what our unbelieving co-workers, the people that we work with, simply find unbelievable. We say we're Christians, but our lifestyles don't reflect it. This is what our unbelieving neighbors, think about those who live around you, simply find unbelievable. This is what unbelieving ch children simply find unbelievable. And so we are Christ's ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20 says that God is making His appeal through us. And, and I, don't, I don't mean for this to be a kind of in-your-face sermon necessarily. But, but you guys will be the only Jesus that some people ever see or ever encounter. And if we're going to be Christians, and, and a Christian is simply a Christ follower, someone who has decided to follow Christ, then we need to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him. So that those co-workers and those neighbors and our children can see that God truly is the main point. He is the one that we serve and that we love. We're going to have a time uh, here of singing and of prayer. And, and I will tell you that I, I'm, I need prayer. I spend way too much time watching Netflix and not spending time with my kids. I spend um, too much time sometimes checking my fantasy football lineup. Some of you who, who set your lineup while I was preaching, you feel really guilty right now, don't you? Okay, yeah. Sometimes we spend a little too much time doing these things. When we really need to, to show our children and to show our community and to show our world that God is the most important thing in our lives. And so if you would stand, we're going to sing. And I want to encourage you, if you have a chance, to maybe come up front.